Hi everyone, we're going to do a lesson today on acids and bases. This is lesson number 9. Now, what the big idea here is acids and bases are solutions that are not in the pH of 7. So that means they have a corrosive property. Now, what does it mean when something is pH? What is this pH scale we talk of? Well, it's a number scale. It is a number scale. on how acidic and likewise because that basic a solution is. So you might know the scale as acids are less than 7 pH and bases are greater than 7 pH and neutral thus is a pH of 7. Now where can you see this list? Now if you have your periodic table on you, you could flip to your periodic table and on the next few pages you're going to see a scale like this that's called a pH scale. And this pH scale is going to show you that you can see that 0 pH is on the left side, 14 pH is on the right side, acids are again less than 7, bases are more than 7, so you see that stomach acid has around a pH of 1, Lemon juice, pH of 2. Grapes is 3. Tomatoes has a pH of 4. Bananas, yes, are acidic, pH of 5. Milk has a pH of 6. And water, being the middle, neutral, is pH of 7. And if you go on the basic side, eggs have a pH of 8. Baking soda is around a pH of 9. Soap is around a pH of 10. Ammonia is a pH of 11. Bleach is a pH of 12. And oven cleaner is a pH of 13. Blood, human blood, you might think it's a bit neutral, but actually human blood is actually a bit basic, around 7.2 to 7.3 or so. So that's what we call the pH scale. Now, how does this pH scale work? Is it just people creating random numbers? Well, it's actually not. It's actually what we call a logarithmic scale. A logarithmic scale is a scale that's used quite often when we deal with what we call exponents. Now more of this will be presented to you in university and in later courses of math, but you just gotta know a pH scale is what we call a logarithmic scale. Logarithmic scale. Now a logarithmic scale is actually in a lot of different types of scales, such as for example Richter scale. And you might know the Richter scale, such as for example that measures earthquake, is when you say, oh, that was an earthquake of seven. Okay, how is an earthquake 7 different from an earthquake of 6? Well, an earthquake of 7 is usually, t it's actually 10 times larger than an earthquake of 6. And that's how logarithmic scale means. So it means one digit change is equal a 10 times change. So how does that work with a log scale for pH. Well, in this case, if you talk about, for example, a pH of 4 is 10 times more acidic than what? Well, it's more acidic than pH of 5. But then, what, how is log pH of 4 compared to a pH of 6, for example? Is it 20 times more acidic? It's actually not. A pH of 4 is actually 100 times more acidic than a pH of 6. And that's because, if you think about it, if a pH of 5 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 4, that means a pH of 6 I mean, not less. Um, pH of four is ten times more acidic than a pH of five. That means the pH of five is ten times more acidic than a pH of six. And that means pH of four must be a hundred times more acidic than pH of six. Now, how do we measure pH? Is there ways we could do that? Well, you might remember using litmus paper back in elementary school to find this if something's an acid or base, and that's also still the way we use. And they're called pH indicators. And if you flip to your data booklet, you're gonna see a list of various indicators we can use in science to help us determine if something's an acid or base. And what an indicator does is it's when it's in a specific pH, it will demonstrate a certain amount of color or a certain type of color. So let's talk about, for example, methyl orange, our first indicator here. 
When metal orange is in a pH of 0, 1, 2, and 3, it will be red. But when it starts to pass around 3.5 or so, it's going to start changing color towards yellow. So it's going to start being a bit orange. And once it reaches a pH of 5 and onwards, it's going to be yellow. Likewise, if you talk about, for example, bromothymol blue, it will be yellow from pH of 0 all the way to around 6, start to become a bit greenish between 6 and 7, and then finally become fully blue once it reaches pH of 8. So these are what we call indicators. They last track pH. Litmus paper is actually one of those pH uh, indicators. So you see litmus paper changes color from a red when it's an acid to blue when it's in base. So we use what we call pH indicators. And what these pH indicators do is they change color in different pHs. So we have various different examples of them. We have, for example, litmus. But the probably the most common one we usually use in science and chemistry in high school is a indicator we call phenolphthalein. So phenolphthalein is right here because it's very easily accessible and it has a very big change in how it's colored because it's colorless in most of the acids and when it comes to base it shows a pink color. So that's a very useful indicator. So phenolphthalein is another one. Make sure I can spell it properly. Phenol. Thaline. Okay, I think I spelled it correctly. Phenol. Thaline. Yes. Okay. So these are different types of indicators we have available in labs. We also have ones at home. We call, so for example, red cabbage juice. If anyone's ever had red cabbage juice, is actually what we call a universal indicator, which means it doesn't really just change pH in one specific region of pH values, but it changes color in multiple um, pH values. Universal indicator. So this is what we call for red cabbage juice, but we also have probably the most common one that we have. We also have digital ones. So digital pH meters. They just literally read the pH value for you. So if you flip to the next page of your notes, you're going to see a table just summarizing this chart. So in this table right here you can see that I wrote down methyl orange will change color from at around 3.2 to 4.4 pH and it turns from red to yellow. So as it turns from from at three before 3.2 it's red above 4.4 it's yellow and in between is when the colors are mixing. So you see phenolphthalein right here, it's 8.2 to 10, and turn from colors to pink. So how do we name acids? Well, acids are really special in the sense that acids are where you actually have hydrogen acting as a metal. So acids is where hydrogen acts like a metal. So if you look at hydrogen in the periodic table, you can see that hydrogen is in the metallic side. And you're going, why? But it's also in the non-metal side. Because when it's in the metal side, it actually acts like a metal. And it turns things into acidic format. So what that means is acids, formulas, has H, hydrogen, at the start usually. There are some cases where that's not the case, such as for example acetic acid, for example. So how do we name acids? Well, there's three different ways we have to name acids, and I'm going to turn this into a slightly a table kind of format, just so it's a little easier for us to keep track of what we're writing. And in this table, I want you to divide it into three columns. Okay. So in these three columns, what we're going to do is we're going to write these as so. We're going to write them first of all as 
monatomic, which means just one type of atom. We're going to write it as polyatomic, but we're going to write it as eight, and we're going to write polyatomic, and this time it's eight. Now you're going, why are you writing eight and eight for polyatomics here? Well, the reason why is because most polyatomics end in eight and eight. So you look at the polyatomic chart in your PI table. If I zoom in just a bit, you can see that most of them end in eight, eight, some of them end in eight. There are only a few that don't end in that case. So because of how they change their ending, we're going to change the way we name our acids if there are these polyatomics attached to the acids. So let's start with the monatomic. Well, if it's monatomic, which means that it's just an element attached to hydrogen, so for example, if it's just any of these elements that we come across, so for example, if hydrogen is attached to chlorine, how do we name it? Well, if it's a monatomic, what we got to do is, first step, add hydro to name. So what that means is it's going to be hydro something to the name. It could be hydrochloride, but now we have changed the ending of chloride as well. Number two, change nonmetal ending to ick. So you get IC to the ending. So so it being chloride, it turns into chloric. So chloride turns into chlor. So ultimately, if it's HCl, it's hydrochloric acid. And at step three, add acid to end. Okay, so it's, if it's monatomic. Now what if it's a polyatomic with an eight? In this case, no hydro. So you don't add the word hydro at all. And what you do, change ending to ick as well. So this time there's no hydro, but the ending is still ick. So what that means is if it's, for example, sulfate, sulfate will turn to sulfuric. And of course, you still add acid to the end. The last example is what if it's it? If it's it, in this case, again, you don't write, there's no hydro involved still. So hydro's only for if it's monatomic. But this time, the ending becomes us, O U S. So that means if it's sulfite, for example, it will now turn to sulfurous. And of course, you still end it with acid. Okay, so let's practice this. Let's start with the first example here, and we're going to see how that changes as we go through these cases. So the first one is HI. HI, as you can see, is iodine is monatomic. If it's monatomic, we want to make sure that we have hydro at the start of the name. So hydro. I is iodine, so that becomes iol, not iodide, is iodic acid. So you gotta make sure you keep the hydro in this case. Now, what if it's H3PO4? In this case, we don't need hydro anymore because PO4 is a polyatomic ion. PO4 is phosphate, and because it's phosphate, it becomes phosphoric acid. Now, why is it not phosphic acid? Um, it has to do with a a bunch of people called IUPAC that determines how chemicals are named, and they wanted to make sure we keep, in this case, the first two syllables to become phosphoric acid. Now, what if it's H3PO3? In this case, because PO3 is phosphate, uh, phosphite, it becomes phosphorus acid. 
So notice the huge difference between how we change the ending. To finish up today's lesson, we're going to talk about what a base is, and then we are done for today. So if we talk about what a base, what bases are, are chemicals that are not acids, if you think of it. But what else do bases have? Bases don't start with hydrogen. Bases end with hydroxide. So hydroxide, it makes them into a base. So examples of bases, for example, is NaOH. That is sodium hydroxide or magnesium hydroxide. These are examples of bases. Okay, They have a pH greater than 7. That's the next thing. And if we were to talk about this in terms of what makes them special, well, acids, of course, they have hydrogen at the start of their chemical compound, so that means they have hydrogen ion. While bases have the OH hydroxide, polyatomic ion. But what happens when we put them together? And if you remember from our types reaction, you can remember that when an acid and base are come together, they come together and form HOH, which we call water. So that's where the neutraliz neutralization comes in. So if you were to finish filling up this lesson with a table, you would see that acids, if you look at that list of different acids we have, you would see that most of these are if you were talking about taste, they're sour. Well, if you talk about, for example, soap, you know soap is bitter. So in terms of taste, acids are sour, bases are bitter. If you touch an acid, it will be corrosive. If you touch a base, it's also corrosive. But it's also actually another property that makes it also special is that it's slippery. That's why soap is very slippery. If you talk about indicator tests, it depends on the type of indicator, but if you talk about litmus, for example, litmus paper will be red in an acid, while it will be blue in a base. Now how it reacts with metals, this will actually be another lesson we're coming up soon. How it reacts with metal is that acids will corrode metal. It will eat away at metal, while with a base, there's actually no reaction. In terms of conductivity, they're both very conductive because they form ions, so they're yes. In terms of pH, acids are less than seven. Well, bases are, well, bases are greater than seven. And last thing, what kind of ions do you produce? Acids produce hydrogen ions. Well, bases produce hydroxide ions. So this is our lesson today about acid bases. What I want you to do is make sure, again, you stay safe and healthy, and I'll see you soon.